the fashion the ocean and mountains well if you do i think this is a collection for you hello my name is jessica and i am the founder of Gruber. welcome to the science story that inspired the seamount collection we had the opportunity to interview our scientists collaborators and deep sea researchers professor bhavani narayana swami and dr natalia serpetti so seamounts what are they they're underwater mountains. So if you imagine you have a mountain on land, that's what we're finding in the, in the deep sea. Um, but unlike on land, where it's, kind, it's quite barren, in the deep sea they can be covered in the most amazing, beautiful organisms. Both that are very large, but also the ones that we find in, in amongst the, the sediment, in, in amongst the coral rubble, these tiny, beautiful uh, creatures. Natalia, you can explain more about what we've been finding. So we did uh, uh, explore the deep sea in the Northeast Atlantic and in the Southwest India Ocean uh, during the time I was working with Bavani. And uh, we looked at macrofauna, which are uh, animals between a few 250 micrometers to a few millimeters in length. And uh, so to see this animal, most of the time we have to sit in a microscope for many years. <laughs> We say that a seamount, to be classified as one, has to be more than a thousand metres in height. Um, but some of the seamounts will be, the, the, the base of them will be at three, maybe four thousand metres below the surface of the ocean. And that's huge depths. A seamount is uh, a feature that arises from the seabed and uh, goes to the, the, sometimes it can even reach the surfaces. But in the deep sea, generally, there are uh, features out of the continental shelves and they can be as tall as the mountain on land, so even three, four thousand meters tall. Uh, but they, we, to explore them and to see them, we need to get in this in very remote place and they are far away from the land. So we need a vessel and we need uh, many days to reach uh, the site. So the shapes and the features of the seamount can change. Uh, there are some seamounts that they are very rocky like mountains over here and uh, um, they, they can have one edge that is very sharp and generally this led to upwelling of deep sea currents and uh, these areas are colonized generally that uh, deep sea corals and their filter feeders. Uh, some other side of the seamounts can have a, uh, uh, get deeper very slowly so and these are more depositionary sites so they are covered by sediments, more by sediments, and here we have more polychaetes than are living in these substrates. They are just incredible features in the deep sea. Uh, so unlike what we see on land, it's always amazing when we go to these places and look at the variety of, of animals, of corals, of sponges that we find, um, that we can see with these remotely operated vehicles, ROVs as they're, they're most commonly known as, but also um, the animals that we can't see so readily. They're just amazing features in the, un in the sea. And what kind of animals can you find in these mysterious and beautiful sea mounds? Of course they are beautiful and mysterious because uh, you can find these kind of animals down there. Uh, we went in the southwest India Ocean in 2011 for six week, uh, weeks at the sea and we sampled across five sea mounds along the ridge and I uh, found this beautiful creature in three different sea mounds and uh, it's a new species. It's a new species of an isopod called Arcurides and uh, as two of them that have been described before, uh, always located in Africa and that is our third one. So I am doing some phylogeny analysis, a DNA, to see how these species are uh, related to each other and how they are positioned within the Valvifera order. So we are looking at uh, DNA and um, uh, then characterize this animal. And that between, uh, by the distance of the analysis of these sequences of DNA, we can establish uh, how they evolve and how close they are in terms of evolution from each other. I'm seeing that they have this kind of polyp. Are they mimicking coral polyps or what, what is unique about them? And are these symbionts? Uh, you are definitely right, Jessica. They are mimicking. They, um, they are living in corals, in hard corals. So the other two species, what I call their cousins, uh, they have the smooth surface 
Another species is called Acuminatus and they have a long spine and this one is the third species. Then the front spine you can see uh, there is a kind of a flower of a polyp and this one was a commensal species living on an earth coral in the deep sea. Even if you live inland, say you live in a big city, everything you do there is connected to the marine environment. You may throw litter on the ground and you don't realise that that actually ends up into our beautiful, look at it, beautiful marine environment. You just don't realise that this happens. And we're not just talking about our coastline, our shallow waters, but actually out in the deep sea where we have been exploring, we have been finding the evidence of humans, of rubbish that's been thrown there. We've been finding them on these amazing seamounts, many thousands of miles from, from land. There should be no rubbish there. And I think it, we have a duty, each and every one of us, to actually protect our vulnerable and valuable environment. We don't know what is in, in many of our deep sea realms. And it's so important that we do more to study these things, to gain more knowledge and protect them if they're required. Sea mounds are very located in a remote place, so we need equipment to get there. And only in the recent 20, 30 years, we had the tool to get in that deep and to investigate and run uh, videos to find the new species. So most of the diversity of seamounts is unknown. So we are destroying or overfishing, for instance, uh, populations or species that we never, we never see before. Ecosystem, then we don't know anything about it. So that the major threat is destroying an ecosystem and a biodiversity that we didn't discover yet. What other risk factors are threatening the sea mounds? So apart from fisheries, the other impacts that we're finding that sea mounds will face um, are things like underwater mining, deep sea mining, where um, sea mounts, some sea mounts are rich in precious metals, um, things like cobalt, and people require these. We require them for many different um, for many different uses, um, and people are looking to extract these minerals from these underwater mountains, from these sea mounts, so that we can use them in our lives. By doing so, it will destroy the habitats um, for the animals that are living there irreparably. We won't be able to. Um, restore these seamounts to their original pristine condition. Once they're damaged, they could be damaged forever and we see this with some of, some of the fisheries, that it takes many, many years for corals to even have polyps regrowing back on the seamounts, let alone for fisheries to come back. So we will have a huge impact if we start mining um, and exploiting the, the metals that we find on these seamounts. Where does Krubak come into play? Krubak is uh, a bridge between the science and the public because we can show creatures that we only scientists can see sitting on a microscope. So it's a way to communicate to the general public the beauty of the deep sea and the, the and his animals. It's really important, I think, for scientists such as myself to interact with companies like Krubag. Um, who blend science and art together to make it appealing to a wider audience so that the general public, so that children can see the wonders that I see, that I'm fortunate enough to, to actually to visualise, to actually see either on my microscope or actually when I go to sea itself, when I'm sat on board a ship and I collect things. Um, I, I want to be able to share that with people and by doing this with Jessica through Krubag, it's such an opportunity not to be missed. Are there any sea mounts close to Krubak's headquarters? So you may be surprised to know that you can actually find sea mounts here. If you go that way, out into the northeast Atlantic, I've had the fortune to study sea mounts such as Anton Dorn Sea Mount, Rosemary Bank, there's Hebrides Terrace, there's the Rockall Bank, and there's Hatton Bank. These are all sea mounts and banks that you can find just behind me, just a day, a day or two steam away from here. Um, what you may not know is that actually Anton Dorn is the tallest mountain in the UK. It's not Ben Nevis, it's actually one that's under the, under the sea. Um, slightly, well, will look slightly different to what you might find on top of Ben Nevis, 
but still very interesting indeed. On this beautiful scarf here is Thyosira, an organism that we find at um, the base of Anton Dorn Seamount um, at 2,200 metres. It's amazing to think, even at that depth, that we're finding such small, intricate organisms such as this. What motivated Natalia to become a deep sea researcher? The love of the sea has been linked for all my life through my family. We pass every day we could uh, at the sea. And when I was a child, I was lying down in the Mediterranean Sea, so much warmer than this, and looking at uh, small shells that were living within the grain size. So I, and uh, my dad he always said now that I'm doing the same, I'm paid to do the job that I was doing when I was three. <laughs> Bavani has a message for you to take home. So my message to you, the general public, anybody listening, is that because the deep sea is out of sight, it doesn't mean it should be out of mind. It is just as important that we protect this vulnerable environment as much as we are looking to try and protect our coastlines. Yeah.